Hello, greetings. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. We're so glad that you've given us this time as we're going to explore what God has made known in Jesus and in Scripture. My name is Ethan. I work with the Venice Church of Christ. We're Disciples Making Disciples in Los Angeles, and we want to be of service to you. We'd love for you to join our conversation today by commenting, uh, subscribing where you found us, and if we can be of any spiritual service, please reach out to us at VeniceChurchOfChrist.org or on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter. In John chapter 3 and verse 14, Jesus says the following to Nicodemus. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Nicodemus has been trying to understand what Jesus has been saying about uh, many spiritual things. And he's having a difficult time. Because Nicodemus is having a hard time understanding the spiritual aspect of it. Jesus has been talking about the need to be born again. And Nicodemus is thinking in terms of some kind of physical birth. So Jesus is trying to tell him that he is speaking of things that come from above. Where he has come from. And is indicating that he will at some point um, perhaps uh, go back. And so he here uses this statement. And we can imagine that Nicodemus is just as confused, if not more confused, by what Jesus is saying here than perhaps he had been before. Not that he would have been confused about the reference. He would have remembered the story of Moses that Jesus is talking about, but the application. How would it be that the Son of Man will be lifted up the way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? Let's consider that question and see what we can learn from the scriptures. We begin by understanding what uh, Nicodemus already had known, the story uh, behind the story here, the story of uh, what's going on in Moses, uh, according to Numbers chapter 20 and begin, 1, excuse me, in verse 4. Then they traveled from Mount Hor by the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient along the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up from Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no bread or water, and we detest this worthless food. So Yahweh sent venomous snakes among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahweh and against you. Pray to Yahweh that he would take away the snakes from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Yahweh said to Moses, Make a poisonous snake and set it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole, so that if a snake had bitten someone, when he looked at the bronze snake, he lived. There's a lot going on with this story. We could spend all kinds of time kind of dealing with some of the things here. Some very powerful questions. Uh, particularly, why is God asking Moses to make a graven image of a serpent when he has just commanded Israel not to make graven images? Uh, a lot going on here, but we'll focus on what the importance is for the story that Jesus is telling. So we see that the Israelites are in the wilderness, and yet again, uh, they are complaining to God. That is not new. This is a feature that happens frequently in the time in the wilderness. This time they go so far as to consider the manna from heaven to be worthless food. They're tired of eating that food over and over again. And so as a punishment, as a consequence, God sends among them venomous snakes. Um, some of the versions read fiery, and that is a very literal translation of the Hebrew. It does not mean that we should imagine that there are a bunch of snakes who are on fire at some point. Uh, no, what happens is, is that they're venomous. Anyone who has been bitten by a venomous snake and has experienced the, the venom would understand and agree that it definitely is a burn burning, fiery sensation, and that fiery serpents is certainly an appropriate way of looking at them based upon what they're able to do. This leads to the death of many. The Israelites want Moses to beg God to get rid of this. Get, get, get the snakes away. Get the snakes out of here. So Moses prays, and God provides a means of deliverance. The snakes are not going away, but now there's going to be this opportunity where this bronze snake is made, and anyone who looks up at that serpent, if he's been bitten, will be healed. So that's what's going on in that story there, where Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. So what does it mean that the Son of Man must be lifted up? 
Well, the first way that we can imagine that the Son of Man will be lifted up comes very naturally to us with the idea of the cross. And there's a lot of correlation between the story here in Numbers and what Jesus does on the cross. When Jesus is lifted up on the cross, he does it not because he has done any sin. The scriptures are very clear about that in, in Hebrews 4.15, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. He did not commit sin, but he was suffering on behalf of others. Others committed sin, and he was suffering there uh, for the sin of others. And this is something that Jesus knew was going to happen, even as he's talking to Nicodemus. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist testified that Jesus was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, which would require that sacrifice. In chapter 2, when he earlier in Jerusalem, he had told the Jewish people, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they all thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem, the large Herodian structure, but he was talking about the temple of his body. He knew what was going to happen to him. When the disciples confessed that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God in Matthew 16, he began to explain to them that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He was going to suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests, and he will be delivered up to die. He knew this was going to happen. He knew this was going to come about, and he endured it, and he suffered it. And in so doing, he allowed people to be healed, to be delivered. There's a very evocative picture given for us in John chapter 18 when we see that a Roman soldier comes up, commanded by Pilate, because there's some concern. The report is that Jesus is dead, but even though we can imagine how awful it would have been for him on the cross, most people who suffered crucifixion took a lot longer to die. And so Pilate wanted to make sure that the report was true that he was really dead. So this Roman soldier was sent, and we're told that he pierced Jesus' side, and out came blood and water mixed together, which was a clear sign that he indeed had uh, died, that, he, that, that it was finished. And yet in doing so, it evokes a, a prophecy, a prophecy uh, that was given through the prophet Zechariah. And Zechariah um, had spoken that the time would come that in Zechariah 10 and 12 and verse 10, that he would pour out on the kingship of David and on the population of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication, so they will look to me, the one whom they have pierced. They will lament for him as one laments for an only son, and there will be a bitter cry for him, like the bitter cry for a firstborn. That Israel would look up to him whom they had pierced. Jesus had been pierced, and we can in a very real way look to Jesus on the cross and see that he was pierced, he was bruised, he suffered for our sins for what we had done wrong, that he took up that upon himself. This is very powerfully tested in Romans 5, many other passages of Scripture, that this is what God was doing in Jesus, reconciling us back to him, and that we are to look at him lifted up on the cross. And when we see him there on the cross, to recognize that he suffered that for us, he was pierced for our transgressions and for our iniquity. And it's because of him that we can have that healing. Very similar to what's going on there in Numbers. The Israelites had sinned. The consequence was these fiery serpents. They get bitten by them, these venomous snakes. They're going to die. There's nothing they can do about it. God provides this way of healing, that if they look up at the serpent, God's power will heal them. And we have been, in a very real way, bitten by sin. There's a reason why uh, the serpent is the one who deceives Eve in Genesis chapter 3. And that the ways of the serpent are very consistent with the ways of sin. The deceitfulness, the trap, the snare, uh, the being bitten uh, without necessarily expecting it, or without provocation, and sometimes with provocation. And of course, there's that messianic promise in Genesis 3 and verse 15 that, uh, yes, uh, the snake would bite at our heel, but we would crush snakes on the head. And, of course, there's a, a very literal, concrete reference to that. But, of course, people see that that is also referent that Jesus would stomp on the head of Satan. And even though Satan bites at our heels, that we can have that forgiveness through Jesus and that Jesus has allowed us to overcome sin through the sacrifice that he has offered on the cross if we would follow him. So a very powerful parallel there between what's going on in the wilderness and what's going on when we look up to Jesus on the cross. But we can't just 
imagine that the idea that Jesus has there in John 3 is that he's going to be lifted up on the cross. The lifting up there seems to be much more a lifting up to somewhere else, up to heaven, uh, where he had come from. And so we also see that Jesus is lifted up in his resurrection and in his ascension and when he is made Lord. We see this already in that prophecy in John chapter 2, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. When he tells the disciples he's going to go to Jerusalem in Matthew 16 and suffer and die, he'd also said he would be raised on the third day. It is such a powerful and important thing that Jesus died for our sins, but if that were the end of it, if he just died for our sins and that was it, it would be a very tragic experience, an awful thing. But he's not the only person to have died under such tragic circumstances. What makes Jesus different is that on the third day he arose. That is not true of Socrates or other people who have died uh, in, for noble causes and noble ways. Jesus, however, now lives. And he ascended to the Father and now reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we see again another way in which Jesus is lifted up. And just like God delivered the Israelites from the power of the, the effects of that snake, from um, the fact the serpents lifted up, we saw that in, in terms of the cross and his death, looking upon him who we, he had pierced, we also can see that in terms of the resurrection, that uh, the death, right, the, the Israelites were suffering death from these snakes, but if they looked up upon the one who was lifted up, the snake, they would be healed from death. In Christ, we can overcome death because Jesus has overcome death. And so we see Jesus lifted up in the resurrection. And this is all very poignantly coming together as we consider the Lord's Supper. And we consider how we have this remembrance every week that we are partake of, the bread representing his body and the fruit of the vine representing his blood. In the bread and the fruit of the vine, we can see Jesus' sacrifice. We can see him on the cross, pierced for our sins. But we take it on the first day of the week, on the day of his resurrection, to remember that he is Lord and that we take it until he comes again because we are waiting for his return. And we see that very powerfully working through that, that, that observance, that supper that we are to continually take to continually remember these things, how we have been delivered through the Son of God and the Son of Man. Now, there's unfortunately a very tragic coda to the story of the, uh, the serpent. We are told in 2 Kings chapter 18 of events going on in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And he is having to do many things to reform what's going on among the Israelites. And we're told that in 2 Kings uh, that he um, smashed down the high places and the sacred pillars to bits in verse 4. And he also cut down the Asherah pole and demolished the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For up to that time the Israelites had been offering incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. So now I have a name for it, Nehushtan, this bronze serpent. And what's happened in that bronze serpent? Well, the bronze serpent was this very powerful thing but it didn't have any power in of itself. It was just a bronze serpent. But the power of it was that that bronze serpent, when the Israelites in the wilderness looked at it, God would heal them. And so it was a conduit, a means by which they experienced the power, the grace of God. And so we can understand the temptation here, what happened. They saw that bronze serpent. That bronze serpent was left as a memorial. It is a testimony that, yes, indeed, this is what happened in the wilderness. Here is the actual bronze serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness. These are based upon events that took place. This is something that's very special to us. And we can see that people then started to invest power or the memory in that, in that object. And therefore, we're offering incense to it. The incense ought to have been offered to the God who had empowered that serpent to provide healing for the Israelites. But the Israelites were giving the de dedication and devotion due to him to the object through which he had displayed his grace. This is not something that is just a temptation for Israel. There are many means by which we receive the grace of God. We receive the grace of God by what Jesus has done on the cross. We receive uh, objects of grace through the Lord's Supper that we share and those emblems that we partake of uh, that help bring us together in Christ. We could say the same of the baptism. Even this, the Bible, uh, has the words of God in it uh, that, from which we can learn of Him and His ways. 
But if we transfer our dedication and devotion to, from God, the one who gave power to that serpent, who gave power to what happened on the cross, who gives power in the Lord's Supper and in baptism, and who has empowered the uh, message of the words in this book to two pieces of wood, to a piece of bread and some grape juice, to water, to ink and paper, then we are not doing much differently than what the Israelites did when they were offering incense to Nehushtan. And that we need to be very careful about that, that we are not giving the glory that should only go to God, to the means by which God provides us deliverance and provides us grace. So this is a really powerful story, isn't it? That Jesus just says in a very short way, that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so all can come to him and have eternal life that we must look upon him who was pierced for our sins, if we would have deliverance from our sin, that we need to look up to him raised as the King of kings and Lord of lords, if we would be delivered from the power of death, and that in so doing we must never allow ourselves to get taken so much with the pieces of wood, with the pieces of food, with water, with anything else, the means by which God has provided uh, the salvation and provided deliverance and to give them the dedication and honor that it should be only going to the God who has done such things and His Christ in His Spirit alone. In all things, may we give that glory to God. May we always look upon Him who was pierced for our transgressions and who was raised for our justification that we can stand before God and overcome sin and death and obtain the resurrection of life in Him. We're again so glad that you've joined us. We hope that uh, you've benefited by what we've talked about here. If you have any questions, comments, about anything that we've mentioned, please let us know. Continue our conversation in the comments. Uh, subscribe to us if you can. And if we can give any uh, help, please let us know at venisertochrist.org or on social media. And may the Lord bless and keep you until we're able to meet again.